I had no chance to leave the GDR during the Cold War, with my knowledge. But my longing for freedom, and it was so unjustified, gave me the energy and the absolute conviction and willingness to try it. My name is Lothar Schulz. I was born in January 1950. That means today I am 73. Um, at the end of the 70s, I spent one year and eight months in the political prison in the former GDR, where I spent in a very small cell of only 7.5 square meters uh, this time and being interrogated. I uh, grew up uh, in a broken family, that means my parents were uh, divorced. It was not so rare after years of the end of the Second World War in East Germany. I grew up uh, very hard. Uh, my mother hit me very often, unjustified. So today I must say I learned already as a child to resist and to fight for my goals, to become a very good student, for instance, in mathematics, physics, and I got it. When I was 14 years old, my dream was to become a pilot, professional pilot, and so I began to use a glider as a glider pilot with 14 years old, very enthusiastic and highly motivated. One year after my beginning as a glider pilot, 15 years old, I began to fly alone. And I did do this also in a pre-military, also for military preparation organization, former GDR, because my father lived in West, Germany, uh, in West Germany, he was a former West German, and married again, and we had some contacts, you know, writing letters, or sometimes we, we got some items from the West we couldn't buy in East Germany. They rejected me to apply one day uh, for the army to become a military pilot. That was the first time that I said to myself, why this? I'm an innocent person, I'm highly motivated. And so there is a barrier for me uh, because my father lives in the West. That was the first small point uh, beginning my own reflection about this. Others could um, maybe fulfill their dreams with a good health, of course, and other conditions fulfilled, but not me. One year before finishing school, I can remember, my class teacher, also party member of the Communist Party, and mathematics uh, teacher, proposed me three studies I, ca I can um, take on. The first was, Lothar, we want you, the state in this case, that you can become a mathematics physics teacher or you can choose become an engineer or you can choose to become an officer in the army. But with my good results I had also uh, I could also uh, choose medicine, human medicine to study. No, I was too well in mathematics and physics and so the state told me via the teacher Lothar we need you, our state in the area of mathematics, physics. So I had chosen engineering and began my studies in 68, when I was 18 years old in Dresden, Technical University in Dresden, one of the best today in Germany. And I had chosen turbo, turbo machinery. It's a very sophisticated studies, high level in mathematics, of course, in physics. So I was again a good student. And interesting is, we had a professor called Werner Albring, 
was a former rocket specialist during the Second World War. And we had a full and high respect, we students, against this man. And you should know, Werner Albring, after the war, short time after the end of the Second World War, had been picked up by the Soviets, 46 as far as I know, with a team of other German rocket specialists, and they brought them together with the families to Russia, to Soviet Russia, where he, where he lived the next five years and helped to develop Soviet rockets. After this, 53, he came back to Germany, in this case to East Germany, and they gave him a post uh, a location in the university to set up this department for, for machinery for turbines. I can remember during the studies, I began a very little bit to criticize this communist system. I could feel already as a, a student of techniques, the system is not good. The system is not efficient. The system doesn't work well. This planning economy, I could feel this. There were a lot of liars. There were a lot of party members. In the reality is opportunists. And this professor Werner Albring protected me a little bit. And I had a, again a good result. That is important to know with this professor. So then I worked in the GDR six years in two kinds of power stations. And I became a project engineer to set up one Soviet nuclear reactor. We needed three and a half years. And I participated in launching two Soviet nuclear reactors. Very soon I could see, ah, there is a problem with Russian language, the very difficult language. All in the former GDR had to learn years Russian, but they couldn't speak. Much too difficult. And I could see something like a sport, sportsman, oh, that's a good challenge. I want to speak with my Soviet colleagues because the nuclear power station came delivered from Leningrad, Soviet Russia, today called St. Petersburg. We couldn't produce these uh, sophisticated things and very expensive things. And with this system came, of course, a lot of Soviet specialists, my colleagues, with whom I could soon speak with a translator Russian. I made very good experiences with the Soviets. They appreciated this. They knew the language was uh, very difficult. And so they gave me much more information with a translator. I can remember that the Soviets told me, Lothar, when you can speak Russian with us, you must be for us automatically a friend of Soviet Russia. <laughs> I can still remember. So sometimes they invited me Friday evening for a last glass to drink. I was a honest, very useful and positive cooperation of highly qualified engineers. In 1976, the GDR wanted to promote me and they came from Berlin and proposed me the following. Lothar, we have a plan with you for the future, for your professional future. At first, we won't like, we would like to send you the next three years to Moscow, to the highly rep reputed Energetic Institute. And you should, you should uh, finish this institute after three years of studies with your doctorate of Inge engineering, or today is called PhD. This made me happy. I felt rewarded for my hard working. Uh, I was really enthusiastic. <laughs> this institute, this energetic institute, today in, a, a Mos in Moscow a University, was a leading institute for the development of the Soviet hydrogen bombs. Because at <clears throat> these times the well-known physics Andrei Sakharov at this institute during the 50s and 60s. He was a father of the first Soviet hydrogen bomb worked there. And he was later the chief constructor of the biggest hydrogen bomb once exploded in October 1961, nicknamed the Saar bomb. 50 megatons. The biggest explosion took place in our humanity.
And then I can remember, I had been invited in the ministry in East Berlin and a middle-aged woman, <coughs> friendly, received me in her office. She asked me friendly, Mr. Schulz, I have one question. How do you think about becoming a member of the SED, the Socialist Unity Party of East Germany, also that means the Communist Party, the real party in power, you know, in the dictatorship regime. And now I followed my conviction. I wasn't convinced about the victory of communism. And I said to her, friendly, Madame, I don't want to make the step to become a member of the Communist Party. How did she react when you said that? Do you remember? She reacted, also almost 50 years ago, of course, mm -hmm. more than 50 years ago. As far as I know, she reacted normally. Okay. Also, she, she wasn't shocked. Okay. No? She, she, she was uh, the same person, more or less. But uh, before saying goodbye, also before giving me the hand, for saying goodbye, I can remember, she said to me, Mr. Schulz, I recommend you not to be too much concentrated, focused, on Moscow. First reaction. Two weeks later, officially, she cancelled this. For me, even today, this was a typical situation. They wanted to promote me. You were a good engineer, hardworking, Russian speaking, very rare. You did your best. Never watched on your, never looked on your watch for the end of your work time. So it was a reason for prom promote you. Sending there to this institute, a very, very interesting institute, very special, maybe less than five people per year, maybe three, four. It's very chosen, very, very chosen for the future, for your future. So that here was an ideological reason, uh, the dominant factor. This was totally wrong in this system. Instead of shoes like in the West later, eh? me as an engineer, applying to shoes, one of the best engineers of this group, she uh, took care and asked you about the party membership. And I was convinced and didn't do this. So it was an inconvenient, but today I would say long term is a big advantage when you follow your convictions. You are honest against yourself. This is important. And many years later, also in Britain, managers can feel this. So that when you speak with them, when you promise something as a, as a consultant, as a project manager, they believe you. People can feel this. There's a big advantage later. <laughs> no? As a, it's the opposite of your first inconvenience, you can't go to Moscow the highest possible level in mathematics and physics. And I like it. I like this ch challenge to face and I couldn't do this and I couldn't go there. Two and a half months later, I was back in the nuclear power station to continue my work with a reactor system. Dr. Meyer, the boss, said to me in the nuclear power station, was the chef of the Department of Research and Development. Mr. Schulz, I would like to hire you because I know you're Professor Werner Albring. But the last word has other department for human resources. The last word. And this last other department for human resources let me wait the next five weeks and then cancelled again and gave me a, a second negative result. So I would say in the meantime I was already a black sheep for them. It didn't matter my high qualification and hard working and Russian speaking and other things, it didn't matter for them. And this was the last step. I was married and we both agreed we can't accept any longer this behavior. We gave our hands to the system. We want to work hard. We gave again our hands <laughs> and they gave us stones in the way. And because of my special workplace during the Cold War, with my knowledge, deep knowledge about every details about the Soviet nuclear reactor system and the security redundancy around the reactor system, I, I was an insider, total insider. I had no chance 
to leave the GDR during the Cold War, with my knowledge. But my longing for freedom, and it was so unjustified, gave me the energy and the absolute conviction and willingness to try it. To try the impossible. And I knew you must meet the Stasi to show this absolute willingness you want to leave the GDR, to tell them why. And the Stasi was for me the decision maker, the real power to decide they sold political prisoners to the West Germany. 34,000 people and got West German marked money. We didn't know whom they had chosen. The risk was high. So that means I had the right to criticize the Communist Party because I told you this why. This hypocrisy, this lying, this opportunism. And as a consequence, as a young engineer, I knew as a realistic person, you must leave the GDR to fulfill your dreams, to work hard, to, to get your challenge as a young engineer in the West Germany and later in other countries. So this was a, the basis, a starting basis. So how to do? You must meet the Stasi. All others can't decide about your destiny. You must show only the Stasi, not others in the GDR, your willingness. And I will do this. I'm, I'm a very open person, straight person. And I, I must tell you today, that I really provoked the Stasi in the center of East Berlin with my banner action, with my with confronting the SED with the critics. What did your banner say? Under the supervision of the party, my wife, Bulgarian doctor, has been bullied in the GDR because she studied in Russia. So today for you, you can't understand this. The big model for the GDR was the Soviet Russia. Daily propaganda told us following the Soviet Russia, that means winning. My banner showed the big difference, the big gap between this daily communist propaganda and the reality. So the communists weren't interested in the reality. So what does it mean, my, my banner? I showed them the opposite of this daily propaganda. That means when my wife came as a young Bulgarian citizen, was one of the best in Bulgaria after finishing school, and they rewarded her to study six years in Leningrad, St. Petersburg, Medici. She was again one of the best students there. And then they came <laughs> uh, with this knowledge to the clinic, dermatology in East Germany in the north, and they told her that the Russians, the Soviets, are too silly, too stupid to make good medicine as party members. And she told her the opposite of the daily propaganda. Can you understand? They were liars and hypocrites. They had advantage going into the party. I didn't do this, but the, these people did do this. One doctor as a party member told her, we hate Russia, and she showed this. When you protested on Alexanderplatz mm -hmm. with your banner, yeah. what did the people on Alexanderplatz do? Very interesting your question. I will answer. I can still remember when I opened my banner, I could never return. So I can, you can compare this with a jump. You can't return anymore when you open your banner against a party. The first reactions of the people were, Maybe they were too much surprised. The first second, they didn't stop. Because it was absolutely rare that the people confronted the SED with a critic. But after the next few seconds, the first stopped and began to read. And within four and a half minutes, there were 50 people around me. The Stasi wrote this in my Stasi file. The majority already, 11 years before the end of GDR, was already on my side. And they said to me, a few, I can remember, finally, there's someone, he's doing something. He's active. They liked this. 
One wanted to take away my banner, couldn't do. I was a very sportive person. Well, they tried to grab it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They couldn't do. Okay. I was very strong. <laughs> active sportsman, athlete. And a few told me, we like to live in the GDR. We have a good life here. Uh, we are free and all these things. Maybe the work for the, for the start in East Berlin, I don't know. But the majority was on my side. And then an American journalist years ago told me, Mr. Schultz, there weren't only these 50 people around you. These people went at home and told this event, you, you carried out this manifestation to the family members and phoned to others. And next day they, they told this to the colleagues in the, in the companies and they told it to others. There was one person criticized the SED. The Stasi came, also as far as I can remember, two in civil dress, showed me an identification card. Was this at home or at work? Where were you? Where, where were you when they arrested you when they came? No, they came into this crowd around me. Okay, okay. Also less than five minutes later, and I began my action. Wow. It was only a short time. Maybe they were nearby in civil dress and so, in the center of East Berlin. Then uh, they took me to the nearby S-Bahn railway station and brought me immediately to the People's, People's Police Ho Hosp Central Hospital, situated in Berlin Mitte, Mitte, nearby, to taking my blood, to check, to control, did I drink alcohol for courage against the fear and did I take a medicament or drug against my fear. I haven't done these things. I prepared my own action for this four weeks before. I began to, to prepare everything, my handling to open the tra big transparent. I had a new dress, new haircut, new shoes, no alcohol, nothing. <clears throat> Telling you this is important because uh, when you prepare weeks long in detail your action without alcohol, without drugs, you are more dangerous for them. So I did do these things right, without reading this in the book. I did do these things right. When you do spontaneously with alcohol, uh, within minutes, such small action, then you are less, uh, less uh, dangerous. Telling you this because import, important for the end of my story. And then they brought me to the Keibelstraße near the Alexanderplatz on an up, upper story where the Stasi had some offices and began to interrogate me. Uh, not screaming, not loud, normal sound. Just, just a conversation? Yeah, there was a, at first a criminal police. And then I can remember that at least two times during the night or after midnight, each time two very tall and strong looking sportives in civil dress came into this office and surrounded me a few minutes, very slowly, like a windmill. One was here, other was here, and surrounded me, very narrow. And I was sitting on my stool <laughs> and didn't move one millimeter. Were they trying to intimidate you? Of course. Yeah. And what I want to tell you, be prepared and, nev and, and keep cool. Be your master of your emotions. And I kept 10 minutes at least, absolutely without one millimeter moving and kept cool. This will also be in, during the prison time. Don't let you provoke, keep cool for your dreams. Keep your, keep your health. And they couldn't do nothing with me. When I had done this with my nerves, then they had hit me, of course. How can you? Turn negative events, situations in a positive sense, in a positive direction. So I can do this. Maybe it's a, it's a certain character and, and uh, comes from my, my birth, I don't know. I have a certain... So I, I believe strongly on myself. And I believed every moment in the prison, I will win. So these guys are intimidating you. They're standing around. I didn't you. react. You didn't react. Mm. What, what happened after that? Then came the Monday morning 
and the published news press in the West. And then changed the sound a little bit of the interrogators of the Stasi. Now they knew this is a big case. Did Schulz col collaborate with the West or not? And that was the reason Erich Mielke, the Minister for State Security, was immediately involved. Erich Mielke requested a report about myself and my action, written by a colonel of the Stasi, six pages. And Erich Mielke wrote a statement the 7 April, after reading this, to his first deputy. And he suspected me that I didn't do this alone. Hmm. He suspected me, check out, figure out, Stasi interrogators the next time, did Schulz collaborate with the West Press or not? I was awake 41 hours, sleepless. During which the Stasi interrogated me in Berlin, uh, also continuing on the motorway, in the car, 26 hours. After doing this, I could sleep uh, almost Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, also it was the 4th April, midnight. And the first seven nights, of course, I was alone in my cell and had to sleep with my back directly on the wooden surface of the small bed without mattress and had to look the full first seven nights in a very bright bulb switched on above the door frame of my cell to make you weaker maybe, to, to make me less resistant. I would say the reason had been, I think, after the suspicion of Erich Mielke. The Stasi wanted to make me weaker, less resistant with these methods to get it, to get the confession, yes, I cooperated with the West. But I was innocent and for me it was no problem to withstand. Then I was uh, the following three weeks again alone in my small cell of only 7.5 square meters. So I lived the first five, four weeks in my cell alone and then the following four months with two fellow prisoners. Yeah, I can tell you after my studies that the Stasi was able statistically, as an average, in every 70 prisons they had, to recruit between 7 up to 9% of political prisoners to become so-called cell informators, also spies. And I don't know this, maybe the second one, more intelligent, had been against me a spy. But I was innocent and the Stasi couldn't get new information. My trial took place in the, in the regional court where I lived in Greifswald. This was the 26 July of 1978, also after almost four months being detained. Mm -hmm. The Stasi transported me with three armed guards, me alone, sitting in such a small cell in our special Stasi van. And when we arrived, maybe 10 a.m., was a beautiful summer season day with blue sky and I can still remember, um, think about my positive mindset. They opened the door and I was so overwhelmed. I was so surprised that I, 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 I could see one moment to another a public green park directly. And it made such a high impression on me, deeply engraved this in my memory. I could see green, green trees, I could see uh, hedge and grass and a lot of different colored flowers. I could see the paradise, the first few seconds <laughs> before leading me upstairs to the trial, uh, trial, to the court. I will never forget this great moment because why is this? I became hypersensitive. I was so hungry for colors I hadn't for months. I was isolated, lived behind glass bricks, not transparent and green colored walls in my cell, day after day. You, you can't uh, experience this because, like me, you live in a normal environment with colors and, and other um, stimuli. So it happened to me. So I have not forgotten a positive thing. 
Sometimes my eyes begin to shine when I tell this, my visitors here, sometimes. So after so many years. And I have forgotten almost that the God gave me a special chain, fixing me uh, against escaping and told me, if you try to escape, I will use my, my weapon, also my pistol. This is a negative thing. I have forgotten these things, but I, had, I didn't forget my positive things, my paradise, the green public park. So the prosecutor was full of hate against me. He got up behind his desk during the trial and screamed against me, full of hate, and never forgotten. He told me, Mr. Schultz, you have no right to use the word humanity a second time to the, during the trial. <laughs> also, humanity I have no right to pronounce. Unbelievable. Hmm. Uh, forgotten, but never forgotten my Green Park. So and then I got one year and ten months as a sentence. It says on here that you were released against your will. Exactly. It it back into East Germany. I see. So you didn't want to be released uh, back into East Germany. Uh, so you, but you didn't serve your, did you serve your full sentence? No. Uh, there was a 30th anniversary of the GDR, 7 October 1979. Mm -hmm. And I got an amnesty a reduction of two months of my original sentence. Also two months le less, also one year and eight months only, almost I spent. During my prison time in the penitential system in Cottbus, you know, where I was one year and three months during this time, the second man again, now promoted to Colonel General Beata, vetoed against my arrival in the West because of my knowledge with the Soviet nuclear system. And the Stasi knew so it is over for Mr. Scholz. He will never come to the West because our second man has, has said no. And this is the reason they released me back to East Germany. It was in November 1979. I, my age was 29. And immediately I began to work in a big cathedral in a church as a stoker and caretaker. And the Stasi opened a special file to survey, for surveillance. And they installed for two, three weeks, regularly, small microphones in our flat, also in our sleeping room, we didn't know, and followed conversations. Below us lived a young family with a small boy. And later I will figure out he was a captain of the Stasi. In my Stasi file, full content of 1,400 pages. You can find more than 100 pages written by this captain. Could listen our conversations. Then the Stasi came back, deinstalled the microphones for a certain time, maybe two or three weeks, and again come back without our, our knowledge and installed these microphones again. This happened during 1980, beginning 1981. We had a Dacia car uh, to complete this surveillance. And also they followed our Dacia car, even more than 100 kilometers, and changed between two cars. And in each car were two Stasi men, and the this, this fifth one coordinated the radio communication in the regional office of the Stasi. <coughs> we didn't know this, we couldn't, could never see them. Being employed as a stoker in a church, having <laughs> Having worked on Soviet nuclear reactors sounds like a little bit of a deliberate reduction in... They're not using your knowledge. Yeah. Uh, Was it a punishment? I want to... No, no. You are right. I want to answer you. The GDR wanted to integrate me again and uh, offered me a certain workplace as an engineer. But you, know, you must know, as a former East German, <coughs> said you have no chance anymore. They won't forget your action. You, are, you will be every time an enemy. You can't never climb the ladder of your engineering career. And then I told them, no, I want to continue my way for freedom. And you can't integrate me again as a <coughs> uh, German citizen, East German citizen. And so my fight continued. 
And the best was not to work for the state. You should uh, work for the church. Because you have to wait, uh, you have to work in the GDR. It was forbidden not to work, otherwise detained again. After almost three years of a fight, my wife was already nine months in the West. She could escape in June, July or June 80 to the West because it was a Bulgarian citizenship. I had a phone call with my wife in the West. And as I said to my wife, I will organize and carry out a second peaceful action against the Communist Party. And this time in Berlin, of course, and I will choose a, a, a large scale. And I said to her, never happened before in the GDR against the Communist Party. So Stasi could illegally listen to every word. I didn't know this. They organized immediately after this a meeting in the district administration of the Stasi in Magdeburg. And some officers said, we want to get rid of him. He will do it. We can't avoid it. Can you remember my first action? Properly organized. The, the new my character. The Stasi said, we, we can't avoid this. He will do it. He's, he's crazy. <laughs> and after this meeting, you, uh, Colonel Lieutenant Neumann wrote a statement, I have this with me, in direction of the veto to the ministry. And the last sentence is interesting. After these facts, facts he wrote, he urged the ministry to let me go. A, a high officer of the Stasi urged the ministry, let him go. And two and a half months after this phone call, it was in 19 May, 81, I could take the Dutch, yeah? correctly treat, treated uh, the last weeks by the GDR administrations. We approached Marine von Helmstedt on the motorway, as also me I approached on the motorway. The same happened to me, correctly treated. And then came an officer, a young officer to me, very tall, two meters, very slim, sportive, a first lieutenant, and asked me friendly, before entering my car for the West, Mr. Scholz, how do you want to leave our GDR? And they said to this first lieutenant, Mr. First Lieutenant, few seconds later I will be free. After three years of fight, I'm so happy. No, and I will be free. My last words in the GDR. Later, you will know, I was a mask camouflaged first officer of the Stasi. And then I passed the boundary post with our three colors of our flag, black, red, gold, and I was free. And believe me or not, my happiest moment in my life, until the end of my life, believe me. And I became one of the happiest persons in the world. Hmm. I have still problems to believe it. Can you see my smile, my shine in my I eyes? I can, I can. This makes me happy. Yeah. Um, what was it like arriving in the West? You must have heard so much about it. Had you? The first was uh, as a smell on the motorway and the cars run so fast. <laughs> the speed, I wasn't get, get used to this high speed. No, it was my Dacia car. No? And then uh, my wife uh, had already uh, made very good stay, steps for her own practice. Mm -hmm. And the first thing uh, I bought in a small supermarket was uh, pineapples. We didn't know in GDR, a small conserved dose of pineapples. <laughs> and I must say you, the following weeks I was absolutely tired, really exhausted. I came to the reaction. Eh? And then I, I joined soon a three months intensive stage of English learning. I had at school Russian and Latin, a little bit English. And I joined it. And during this uh, three months, I got 13 work offers. Because my professor Werner Albin was also well known in the, in the West. And began to work in West Germany without recovering, without holidays, nothing in 2nd January 82. Can I ask you, after reunification, a lot of people yeah. had access to their Stasi files. Yeah. 
what was that like for you? What did you did you find anything in your files that surprised you? Were there people who you trusted, who you found out were informers, mm -hmm. or I mean, it must have been very difficult for a lot of people to go through. Also, for me, it was excellent that even suspected people, I thought maybe they worked for the Stasi, you know, like against me. I was wrong. That was a good surprise. That is amazing. That is such yeah. a different way of telling that story. Yeah. The fact that you, and that shows your positivity, yeah. that you were happy to find that people weren't informers. Not, they, they didn't, they didn't uh, work for the Stasi. It was a good, uh, positive surprise. <laughs> What, what is your message to the societies yeah. of the future? Yeah. Bearing in mind what you've lived through and what you've done. Exactly. Set my highest value in my life, I absolutely appreciate, is a freedom for the people, for the society, in a democratic system. There's so many possibilities. That, and appreciate like work performance. Without a good performance, you will fail. And this the GDR did do. They didn't accept my hard work performance. Ideology was more important. And be honest to yourself. Follow your honest convictions. Maybe you will make a sacrifice. Maybe you will get a disadvantage. But long term, you can look in every mirror that keeps you healthy also in your psyche. And long term, you will you will have with this a big advantage. Thank you. That's all. Yeah. David McMillan. I was a smuggler for nearly 40 years, and that involved prison, which I took on the chin mostly, but sometimes it just doesn't work out. Bangkok was one of those. Execution, or near enough to it, two weeks away, and that meant, when it comes to prison, escape.